Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So this week for my Game of Thrones bonus video, I wanted to talk all about the Wildlings. At this point in Season 4, we haven't seen a whole lot from them, and the Thens are the only real new tribe or you know group of Wildlings that we've met. So what I'm going to do is a breakdown of their history, as well as some of their more notable tribes. If you're finding me for the first time, I do Game of Thrones bonus videos every week. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. Also, because there's no new episode next week, I'm just going to be doing a regular bonus video. So be sure to leave me suggestions for what you guys want to talk about. Also, round 7 of my weekly giveaway will start whenever I post my episode 7 review tonight. So let's talk some free folk. That's actually what they call themselves. You know, like people who live in America call themselves Americans. The term wildling is actually like a racial slur that people in the South started to use. So wildling is actually a derogatory term, which is why I wouldn't recommend using it in Egret's presence. She actually spent most of season 3 trying to dispel Jon Snow's preconceived notions about their culture. But the funny thing is, is that the people north of the wall also have a derogatory term for people south of the wall. They call them kneelers, as in they kneel to a king, like Aegon the Conqueror. So just because people in the south are super racist against people in the north, doesn't mean that the people in the north can't also be super racist against people in the south. There's just a lot of racism going around in A Song of Ice and Fire in general. I like to think Jon Snow was a pretty open-minded guy, but the other highborn people in the Night's Watch, like Yeno Slint, are pretty extra super racist. The interesting thing about the Free Folk is, is that, yes, you know, they do share some common beliefs, but they're really a society made up of a bunch of pockets of smaller groups. They're like a patchwork society of people, all with their own communities, because life is so hard beyond the wall, those communities also tend to be pretty insular. Which is why it was such a huge deal whenever Mance Raider united them. And not just them, he also got the giants to come out and play. He's pretty charismatic, but I think he probably just showed them all a picture of a white walker and everyone collectively crapped their pants and started running for the wall. But where did the Free Folk Society originate from? The oldest living inhabitants that we know about in Westeros, at least on the continent, are the Children of the Forest, but they're a whole different race of beings. The oldest living human inhabitants that we know about are the First Men, and that goes back about 12,000 years. It's totally possible there were other humans in Westeros before that, but record keeping didn't really become a thing until the Andals came and formed the Seven Kingdoms, which was thousands of years after that. The Thens we met in Episode 1, those cannibals, claim to be the last of the First Men. Technically everyone in the Seven Kingdoms, you know, south of the Wall, is a descendant of the Andals, not the First Men. But there's a lot of interbreeding, so we can talk about that in a second. And as a quick side note, the Thens are not actually part of the Free Folk. They're actually a whole nation to their own with laws and a king. The Free Folk are more like a free range group of people like Craster, just living without real government or a single leader. The Thens are like a fully formed nation state, a pretty big one when you look at the map right here. So the Free Folk kind of evolved from the first men that had just always lived in the north, as well as people who migrated north whenever the Andals invaded just because they didn't want to bow to a king. Then you always have a few people who are just trying to escape the law, or bailing on the Night's Watch. So whenever we first met Mance Raider's army in Season 3, we were seeing a bunch of different groups of people, including the core Free Folk, like the Free Ranch communities, then there were the Giants, which are clearly their own separate race, and the Thens, which are a completely different nation of people. The show is kind of combining a lot of things just to make it easier to digest, but generally all you need to know is, is that Free Folk are different from Thens, are different from Giants. The show made the Thens cannibals too, and that's a small change from the books. The real cannibals inside the books were another community called the Skagos. They just decided not to feature them on the show. So right now Mance Raider is called King Beyond the Wall because he united all those different groups and races of people. He tries to downplay the term king mostly because not bowing to a king is one of their core beliefs. But he's not the first person to do that. There have actually been six people since the wall was built that have united the people north of the wall. What happened was is a single person or in one case two brothers united everyone in the north to try and get past the wall mostly to invade the south. Which is kind of funny because they're kind of ignoring one of the core reasons why the wall was built. Not to keep the free folk out, but to bar off the lands of always winter from the south. You can actually see that area on the map right here. So the wall is not trying to keep people north of the wall out. It's just trying to keep this one area barred off. These other people who lived over here near the haunted forest and the other areas actually fought with the children of the forest and the other first men to end the last great battle with the White Walkers. So technically they should be everyone's friends. But naturally then the wall was built and hundreds and hundreds of years passed and people totally forgot about the White Walkers. So they started to think more about the wall as like a class barrier. 
And then that's when the term wildling became a racial slur and relations devolved to the point at which we're seeing on the show right now. Everyone has forgotten about the true threat. Everyone except for Mance Raider, who totally understands what's going on with the White Walkers and a few other people on the show. So let's talk geography real quick. There's a couple main areas up north of the wall. The most densely populated areas are naturally in Then and the Haunted Forest. The further north you go, the colder it gets and even the free folk have their limits. Craster's, for example, is the closest village to the wall, if you can call it a village. As of the events of episode 6 though, that no longer exists. Back in season 3, whenever John first met Mance and saw his army, they were up here in the Frost Fangs. So now we're starting to catch up with the show. So remember, the raiding party with Egret, the Thens, and as well as Tormund Giantsbane are coming from the south side of the wall. As of episode 3, when they killed these villagers right here, they were directly south of Castle Black. So the raiders are attacking from the other side of the wall, which is a huge problem because there aren't really a lot of defensive positions on the south side of the wall. There's actually a really interesting story as to why that is, because it's Castle Black, so you'd think Castle naturally would be fortified, but it's not fortified from the south. Way back after the Night's King, remember this guy we saw in episode 4, turned into a White Walker. Remember, he was the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Once he turned into a White Walker and started enslaving the other Night's Watch brothers, he rebelled against the Seven Kingdoms and turned the Night's Watch into his own small little kingdom for a little while. As a result, whenever he was defeated, laws were passed that said that the Night's Watch could never build defenses on the south side of the wall, so that if the Night's Watch ever went bonkers in the future, they wouldn't be able to sustain a fortified battle against the Seven Kingdoms. And as an unfortunate consequence of that, totally unintended, whenever the Free Folk attack from the south, they'll have a much easier time taking Castle Black. That's really what we're getting ready to watch play out on the next episode, episode 7. So cross your fingers that the rest of the brothers listen to Jon Snow's counsel, because everyone but Sam and maybe some of the new people in the Night's Watch seem pretty ignorant. So what I'm really excited to see in this next episode is what the Night's Watch does to try and repel this invasion. And remember, it's not Mance Raider's army, it's just a raiding party. The raiders are trying to open the gates by the time Mance's army arrives at the other side of the wall. So you have a small force here poking at the Night's Watch at their weak point and this massive army on the other side getting ready to flow through this little area. And they're all converging on it at about the same time. So this is all happening at once. Be sure to send a raven to your loved ones because it's going to get very, very bloody tonight. I'm really interested to see if they do more cannibal jokes. But now it's your turn. Let me know below in the comments what are you hoping to see in tonight's episode. I think we're all kind of crossing our fingers for an egret, you know nothing, Jon Snow moment. She's really pissed right now. So tonight I'll be posting my episode review after episode 7 airs. Be sure to subscribe to get it. I'll be posting that Q&A tomorrow like normal. And feel free to keep leaving me suggestions for bonus videos. You guys have been giving me a lot of really fun ideas lately. So right now you can click here to get that episode 7 video. I'll have the annotation as soon as I post it. And you can click here to get the Q&A. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in a little bit. High fives.